Annyeong! Welcome to Delightful! Are you ready to fish up a sea dragon? I am! Let's look through the concept art and see what you guys chose. Before I dive in, I tend to do a couple sketches just to fill out the character I'm trying to make. These sketches generally don't even make it into the video, but I thought I'd show you this time. From the get-go, we can see the main influences. An extruded bindi body inspired by sea serpents, select features chosen from a variety of real sea creatures, and an androgynous face and frame. Once I have this vague character type in my head, we move on to the first round of concept sketches for you to vote on. The census on these first pass designs was that 3 was very popular for its obvious sea dragon reference and unusual silhouette. But 1 and 2 looked as though they could swim fast through the water. Taking these critiques into consideration, I created second pass designs. I honestly had placed my bets on 3A, but 3B won in a landslide. I think people liked the sleeker, faster looking fish-like body, and many people thought the sea dragon-like wings were too complicated. 3B also has a nice fin to body ratio, and we kept the anglerfish elements that people liked in design too. Next up, color studies. To me, the sea dragon should feel exotic, wild, and a little bit frightening, just like real sea creatures. From the comments I received, it sounded like many of you were expecting a bluer color palette, you know, like water. But the thing is, I've made several watery ocean dolls already, so I was looking for something different. Instead of a personification of the ocean, think of this dragon as a creature inhabiting the sea. A and B are based on my favorite fish, the mandarin fish. And C is based on both general tropical fish colors and my inability to resist a chaotic rainbow color scheme. And wouldn't you know it, you guys can't resist rainbows either because C was voted twice as popular as the others. Let's get customizing. This She-Ra doll should make a good base. She's taller and more muscular than my other dolls, which should lend itself to a strong swimmer type body. To the crafting table! Before modifying the doll, it must be stripped down to its most basic format, which includes popping off the head, cutting off the hair, and wiping off the face. This doll is going to undergo some very dramatic changes, so I've taken the time to map out and sort of make a blueprint about how all the parts will work together. This dragon is going to be a semi-ball jointed doll, meaning several loose parts will be strung and held together in place with elastic. If you thought Terra was ambitious, buckle up! I thought I may eventually make a doll more involved than our Earth Dragon, but I didn't realize it would be on the very next project. Now the mutilation, I mean artistic changes, can begin. Let's protect the camera lens. There we go. They'll be getting new legs, new arms, and a longer torso, so the dermal tool is going to get a good workout. To trim up and separate the last bits, I often use my shears. There we go! They're all in pieces. We won't be needing the legs, or the arms. So believe it or not, this is what we're really starting with. Doesn't look like much, does it? For the midsection piece to fit nicely into the chest cavity, use a sanding head on the dermal tool to grind back the support beams left over from the original doll's casting methods. Sand down the breast to flatten out the chest into a more gender-neutral physique. Now with the real doll in front of me, I draw up a more detailed plan of the arm and how to go about constructing them. With a longer torso, the arms must also be longer than the original dolls. A general rule of thumb is that the elbow should line up with the waist, and the wrist should line up with the crotch. Getting proportions to match a doll body that hasn't been made yet is tricky stuff. Same goes for the legs. I used the base doll to sketch out real size schematics for their new fishy legs. I want to sculpt each limb as accurately as possible, so I took the time to scan in and separate the drawings into parts, which I can sculpt on top of for reference. I'll be honest, this was a lot of new ground for me, and it was a bit intimidating. There are so many parts to create, I wasn't sure where to start. I'm sure this looks like child's play to the seasoned ball-jointed doll sculptors out there, but I find it quite exciting and challenging. Before I can begin sculpting, I must first install the hooks and armature wire required to hold the elastic. After drilling lots of holes, I bend and cut my trusty 16-gauge 2-pound wire into the following shapes. 
Run a bar of wire through one side, catch the loop of the hook, and out through the other side. This should ensure that no matter how tightly I string the elastic, nothing's coming loose. I place these hooks at the butt, base of the neck, and one in each upper arm. Secure the wire with epoxy glue. My biggest concern for this project was how to keep such tiny pieces hollow. A string has to be run through them, remember, so they can't be solid. How about using straws for a start? I'm continually working towards a zero-waste lifestyle, so I keep all the straws thrust upon me in hopes of using them in projects. Because of this, I have several sizes to choose from. Once cut down to size, I mix up a small batch of epoxy sculpt, smoosh it flat, and fully surround each tube. While that cures, I make a first pass over other parts of the doll, covering up all the armature wires, glue, and rough edges. Remember you can dip a finger into water to keep the epoxy from sticking to your gloves. You can also use water and a bit of elbow grease to smooth that transitional area from epoxy into plastic. Five lengths of jewelry wire twisted together make a basis for hands. They too receive a small blob of epoxy to begin forming the palm shape and also to set the wires in place. Looks pretty funny so far, what with their tube arms that don't really fit together, but it's a start. Now we can begin the great back and forthing, which is trying to get small doll parts to fit together well. Build up the forearm at the elbow and a little bit at the wrist. Bulk up the deltoids and triceps. and cap off the ends of the shortest tube to form a bean-like elbow joint. Whittle down the thickness of areas that will be in contact with another piece, like at the base of the forearm here. I'm using wood carving tools. And continually test the pieces to see if you've carved out enough, have the fit just right, or carved out too much. It's tedious and difficult work, but I sure learned a lot about doll making and respect doll sculptors even more now. Epoxy sculpt takes several hours to harden, so as you can imagine I work on different parts of the doll, like the mid-torso piece here, while other parts harden. Then I come back and continue refining the arm shapes and so on and so forth. Honestly, it's hard to edit a video like this. I wish I could show you the hands, the arms, the torso sculpting from start to finish in a nice orderly presentation, but in actuality I do a little bit over there, add fingers to the hands, go back to the torso, it's all over the place. And even after hours of work, it can still look bad, like the torso piece here. I'm having trouble getting it to sit right. Thankfully, I do have an actual ball jointed doll in my possession. Who remembers Verna? Hey girl, it's been a while. You're looking great. This gave me the opportunity to observe in person how this doll's manufacturer produced the joints. They're deceptively simple at first glance, but look closer and you can see the engineering and fine tuning that went into every piece. Okay, I'm feeling inspired again. I just need to try harder. These areas where parts meet is key. The lip of the overlapping piece needs to be thin so that it lays flat, and just inside there needs to be a concave structure to catch and hold the preceding piece so that it won't slip all the way in. The concave bottom of one piece needs to perfectly hold the top of the next piece, so to get a perfect match, I apply fresh epoxy to the chest cavity, dunk the mid-torso in water so that it's nice and slippery, and make an impression into the fresh epoxy. I can't overstate the amount of fine-tuning that went into this doll, but I'll spare you having to watch all that. Let's make the legs! I've made several popsicle stick dragon legs at this point, so these felt slightly more familiar, although this time we're attempting a double hinge joint at the knee. How fancy! This shape should allow the doll to both fully extend the leg and sit all the way back on their haunches. I cut the sticks down to size and double up the thickness in places as you can see here. 
Once the glue dries, I carve down the sticks to fit inside the drawings I'm using for reference. Drill holes the right size for your bolts. Be careful on the double knee joint though. They should be as close together as possible while still allowing the ends of the sticks to roll past each other. I test it out and mark it before drilling the second hole. Nice! I glue on small blocks to the back of the legs to keep them from overextending. And now we can move on to sculpture. Smoosh blobs of epoxy on over the nuts, which should face the outside of the leg. This will hide the mechanics from view. On the inside, we still want to have access to the bolt heads, but you can semi-hide them with coils of epoxy. Plug the legs into the doll. I impale another wire through the thigh just for strength. What do you think so far? It's starting to sink in how very long this doll is. I hope I didn't make the body too long. To sculpt the majority of the legs, I'll be using Deco Doll Air Dry Clay. If you ever wonder what materials I'm using during any given project, you can find them listed in the description box below the video. Once again, the drawing comes in handy for size reference and clay distribution. And thanks to this clay being super easy to use, I can bat out these pieces fairly quickly. Just like everything else, they take a couple passes to get just right. I thought I'd use the clay to push myself to improve the hands while I have it out. To finish the hands, I cut off the rest of the armature wire, we don't need that anymore, and carve a slit down into the ball at the wrist. This was not easy because of course there are wires in there, so I basically had to brute force it with the Dremel tool. There's gotta be a better way. Once the slots are carved out, drill a hole into the slot at a perpendicular angle. This is delicate enough work that I'm using a handheld drill. Eventually, I get this. Using a humble paper clip, I form these small hooks. The loop goes down into the slot, and a different wire peg is inserted through the loop. Ta-da! Pretty slick, right? Seal the tips of the wire with a tiny epoxy blob and they're good to go. Now seems like a good time to address the head. Like every other dragon doll, the head is shrunk down in size using the acetone bath method popularized by Derilli dolls. Two hours of pure acetone, 24 hours dry time. Repeat until the head is the right size. Admittedly, it wasn't a big change for this doll, but still worth it so that they match the others. Cut down the height of the neck peg and cram that sucker back on there. The ears themselves are also ball joints, which means there's work to be done on the head. I made two epoxy balls with wires sticking out of them for the ears. And just like the wrist joints, we cut a slot, drill a hole, and place the peg and hook in place. Two holes are carved out of the head, and we need to make a concave cup shape here as well. I use the rest of epoxy to fill in the holes left over from the rooted hair and give the face a couple tweaks as well. I'd like the nose to be a tad wider and the mouth to be a lot bigger. Remember when I said the sea dragon should be a bit frightening? Well, that's coming into play here. Along with the lures, this wide, toothy mouth is inspired by the anglerfish. Wow, that's a lot of pieces! The last step of the sculpting phase is to sand and buff out all the epoxy and clay until it's nice and silky smooth. Just look at all the junk on that table. My workroom becomes an absolute dusty nightmare whenever I do one of these projects. So much of this project had me wearing a gas mask for safety that I had an imprint of the mask on my face for like three days afterwards. Sculpting phase done! Both the doll parts and my studio have been thoroughly cleaned up, and we're ready to move on to painting. But before that, I just have to string them together. 
I've got to know how the parts look. I've been staring at loose bits and pieces for weeks. Here's how to do it. First, the ears. Using a hair elastic folded in half because it's too long, loop one end over a hook and thread an embroidery thread through the elastic. Feed the thread through the head, keeping it pulled tight, and stretch the elastic all the way out the other side. Feed the second hook through the elastic, and now you can let go and retrieve the thread. I know they look like a weird Mega Man knockoff right now, but hopefully that will change. Same thing for the torso, only I've sewn a loop of much thicker 2.8 millimeter elastic to pull through. The arms were most challenging. Using a thin one millimeter elastic, I sew a loop. Now, I know there's a hook down there somewhere, but I can barely see down the tube. With enough feeling around, eventually the loop caught on, thank goodness. Then it's the same thing. Feed the elbow bean, forearm, and eventually hand onto the elastic via embroidery thread. Right away, it's apparent that this is my first time making doll arms from scratch. There's definitely room for improvement, but I'm proud nonetheless. Oh no. <laughs> that doesn't look good. And with the legs screwed back on, we can take our first look at the doll in its entirety. I'm very happy with the range of movement. They can scrunch up into a tight ball and stretch out backwards into an arch. It's great when all that hard work pays off. My biggest concern is that paint will immediately get scratched off around the joints. So, taking the thinnest felt I own, I glue down tiny soft barriers onto each and every socket. I'm sure I've seen this technique used on delicate porcelain dolls for a similar reason. Hopefully this protects the paint and helps the doll hold a pose thanks to the felt's high friction surface. Okay, now we can paint this sucker! First I coat all the parts with a surface primer. I love watching all the dull gray epoxy get cleaned up by a fresh coat of paint. Once crisp and white, I dig out all my acrylic paints in rainbow order. I've also printed out the concept art so I can reference it as I go. If you work fast and in small areas at a time, you can blend acrylic paints to make smooth transitions. The airbrush would have produced the smoothest transitions, but heck if I'm touching that thing again anytime soon. You may recognize these fluorescent paints from Aurora's video. This is only my second time using them, so maybe this will help the sea dragon match Aurora. It kind of looks like an Easter egg dye kit or something, and <laughs> I'm the kid that's like, I will use all the colors. Their claws and nails get a blue manicure. And once the gradations are all in place, we can come back on top with the stripes. I use a pale yellow for most of the stripes, but switch to a pale pink in some areas like the feet and torso. The big chunky feet almost look like pool toys because of the bright neon colors. I'm also getting major Florida vibes. I paint many of the stripes with the doll strung together, just so that they flow into each other. I separate the pieces and fine tune the stripes a bit later. The stripes on the hands and arms are darker blue in contrast. Let's go ahead and finish the face while we've got our paints out. I sketch on outlines with a graphite pencil before adding paint. I haven't used my actual watercolor pencils to do a face in a long time, but what can I say? I'm still in a painting mood. The face of the rainbow fish design was arguably the most plain. I really liked the faces of my mandarin fish designs better, so I'm going to work in some elements of all three here just for fun. I throw down a stripe under the eyes and a lash line in dark blue. Add some eyelid lines and shading, whiten the eyes themselves, 
and add a bit of color to the lips. I changed the stripe from pink to orange because I thought the pink came across as like the flesh under the eye. You know when you pull the skin down under your eyes you can see inside the lid? Eh, not what I wanted. I think orange looks much more stripe-like. For eye color, I stuck with watery ocean blue. A little highlighting and shading around the pupil for depth and personality. And a highlight or two in the eyes. They've been toothless up until now, so let's fix that. Cutting out the tiniest, most teensy sliver of white cardstock paper, I dab some glue into the mouth's crevice and insert the paper. Once it fully dried, I delicately cut off that funny chipmunk tip with a sharp razor blade. Finish their toothy smile with two bottom jaw fangs, one protruding from each corner. A little glue on all sides should help them stay put. To protect all that paint, coat the doll in one to three layers of varnish. My varnish dries glossy, which is the effect I'm going for this time. Hopefully the skin will look slicky and wet. Let's string them together once again. Paint phase complete! Time for fins, starting with the smaller frilly fins lining their shoulders and hips. I cut out and paint these U shapes out of cotton fabric before delicately gluing them around the body. Design element? Yes. Strategically placed to conceal the joints if and when the paint rubs off? Also yes. Let's set the doll aside and focus on making fabric for the fins next. Ever since y'all voted for the rainbow fish design, I couldn't stop thinking about tie-dye. Tie-dye is perfect for pretty, splotchy rainbow colors. Or so I thought. The only tie-dye materials I could find quickly and locally was this. Primary colors and that's it. I bought two kits so that I had room to experiment and mess up if need be. My husband joined me for the first two test shirts. He went for the classic swirl and I tried the scrunch method. And, well, his turned out beautifully and mine turned out like a clown's Rorschach test. The whites of my shirt also yellowed. It's absolutely awful. I used the second kit to mix custom colors and managed to mix up all the secondary colors. Here we go again. My husband's shirt came out so good that I thought I'd try the swirl this time. I filled in each pizza slice with the color of the rainbow, then flipped it over and did the same thing on the other side. And ta-da! Attempt number two is far superior. But as much as I love how it came out, the truth of the matter is, there's just no way to get those mint greens and bright cyan colors with the pigments provided. It's literally impossible to mix those. I gave it my best shot. So what's plan B? Well, what do you know, neon tie-dye fashion has started popping up all over Korea. I could hardly believe my eyes. I snapped up four potential candidates off of G Market and a couple days later they arrived. Here's the body compared to the fabrics. None of them are quite perfect for the sea dragon, but I think I can mix and match for an adequate result. If you're wondering why I bought shirts instead of fabric off the bolt, well, have you ever tried fabric shopping at Dongdaemun Market? It's like navigating a claustrophobic nightmare maze. So yeah, funny enough, shirts are easy to come by. Start forming the tail's shape with a long twisted length of wire. Strap on four additional twists of wire to make the individual fins armature, and bind them to the main wire with smaller wire. It's not good enough to just have the tail be poseable. The gigantic fins need to hold a pose as well, so I create more armature wires branching off from each loop of the tail. Next, and I'm not sure what compelled me to do this, I wrapped up the entire tail like an Egyptian mummy and stitched it in place. Maybe it's because the wire itself is kind of dirty, or I wanted to hide the black color of the wire from being visible on the final tail. Either way, it feels very secure. I drew templates of the fins out of paper first before cutting them out of the fabric. Because I want the wire to be sandwiched inside, each fin needs a front and back piece. 
I tried to place the pieces on the most colorful and appropriate sections of the fabric so that it will be as close to my concept art as possible. One fin at a time, I pinned them thoroughly around the armature wire and around the edges. At the last minute, I decided the biggest fin needed two more poseable wires, so I added those real quick. And now the stitching can begin. I sew by hand around the entire parameter of the fin and up and down either side of all the bones. Needless to say, it took ages, and that was just one fin. I have to do that four more times. Okay, fast forward a bit, and boom, tail fin's done. It was worth the trouble of hand stitching everything for the accuracy. I doubt I would have gotten as clean a result on my machine, especially around the wires. The main body of the tail comes last, so that it can lay on top and neatly conceal the base of the fin. As always, I sketch out a paper pattern first to gauge the size, then cut it out of fabric. After folding under the seam allowance and sewing the tip down onto the fins, the side seams are then sewn together using the ladder stitch. Basically, we're creating a finished edge from the outside by folding under the seam allowance and weaving our way back and forth. When you pull the thread, the sides pull together like so. Very clean. Once both sides are stitched all the way to the top, leave a hole open so that we can fill the tail. This fluff is all leftover fuzz from making acrylic yarn wefts. Perfect for stuffing. Now to plug the tail into the body at last. This tail also sits very low on the character, like an extension of the body, so this poor dragon also receives an unwanted colonoscopy. Use your strongest epoxy glue to set the wire permanently in place at the base of the spine. Dab a little more glue on and fold over that last bit of loose fabric on the back. This helps the transition from tail to doll look more organic. I'm relieved to see that the long tail justifies the long body proportions. Before the tail went in, they just looked like a long awkward frog person, let's be honest. The head fin was a bit tricky. I began as usual with a paper mock-up and two fabric pieces. Then I glued the top part directly to the doll's head and awkward head horn. Finally, I can cover that thing up. I then glued the fabric down the back of the head. I run a gathering thread down the back to scrunch up the fabric, then fold open the fabric at the gathers like opening a book and glued them to the back. The tiniest fins are placed individually between the fingers. I prepare the remaining fins in a similar fashion to the tail fins, sewing halves together and eventually connecting the fins to the body. As pretty as the fins are, I'm still not completely satisfied with the color. It's not as bright or saturated as the body paint. So, I'm going to stain it with a watered down dose of acrylic paints. I know, I know, it was a disaster on Neeks's tail, but this is different. We're working from light to dark and simply going to enhance the existing colors rather than coat the fabric completely. Thankfully, it worked! It did not take much pigment at all to accent the neons and bright colors of the original fabric. To finish the paint job, the fins and tail receive their stripes. I found it easier to do this with the doll elevated, so pardon this odd view of my workroom's floor. Every time I think I'm done, there's more to make with this doll. Stay with me, we're almost there. Remember the deep sea fish lure feature? I paint a strip of wire white with gesso, then bright blue with acrylic paint. Use hot glue to form the bulbous ends, and paint them to match. I sew the wire to the base of the tail. Use paper, paint, and dollops of hot glue to form watery bubble gems. 
Cut them out once dry and apply them to the doll. And that, my friends, is the final touch. They are ready to swim, leap, and dive into the ocean. Say hello to Aquarian. Aquarian is an odd combination of elements. There is a playful quality that comes with the bright colors and friendly eyes, but also a mysterious and strange quality due to the long limbs, webbed monster hands, and pointy teeth. I don't know if you caught it at the start, but Cirque du Soleil is one of my inspirations, and I think it definitely shows. She-Ra was already a larger doll to begin with, but thanks to the extruded limbs and gigantic flowing fins, this doll accidentally grew to a massive size. I suppose it's fitting, I mean, animals can grow to incredible sizes in the ocean, right? And there we have it! The Sea Dragon Aquarian has joined our Dragon Squad! There's one more element to go, and it's a Dragon Classic, Fire! If you want to vote and have your say in the concept art, feel free to follow my socials. I've also been trying to remember to post the polls on my community tab here on YouTube, but what can I say? I'm more of an Instagram kind of girl. At any rate, I hope you enjoyed the video. And I hope you're looking forward to the Fire Dragon as much as I am. I'll see you then! Stay artsy! Annyeong!